Thank you very much, Professor Cano, and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, symposium. Uh, and really, my job actually today is to really uh, set the um, uh, the table for uh, the next two uh, speakers. Uh, so I'm going to be going through an overview. I'm sorry, I'm going to be covering a lot of material quickly. So I hope I don't challenge the translator too uh, severely. But in any event, uh, we will uh, cover, I think, a topic that I think is very relevant to us uh, in this current day of imaging. So these are my relevant disclosures. We've had, fortunately, an access to a lot of different instruments, including the TopCon um, devices we'll be talking about in this uh, discussion of swept source technology. So I want to start first with just an overview about swept source OCT. I know many of you are already familiar, but it's always worth uh, talking about, about where we've come uh, with regards to this technology. And a reminder to all of you that swept source OCT is another uh, Fourier domain OCT uh, technology. So, you know, in the past we were interchangeably using the terms Fourier domain and spectral domain, but we probably shouldn't because uh, spectral domain and swept source are both Fourier domain technology. So, in any event, uh, the advantages of swept source, and Nathan Chowdhury will really talk a lot about the advantages of swept source versus spectral domain OCT and geography, but just in general, the advantage of swept source OCT is, yes, it's faster than spectral domain OCT, but the advantage that I want to really emphasize through the course of this presentation is the better sensitivity uh, that it features, and I'll give some illustrations to explain that. So again, the difference in terms of the instrumentation, uh, both, uh, both types of devices, spectral domain and swept source, and encode the depth information in the frequency space, but how do you get the frequency information? With spectral domain, you get it with a broadband uh, light source and, and the spectrometer to get the frequency information. With a swept source system, you use a tunable dye laser, so you don't need a spectrometer, so you're able to get this information in frequency space, uh, and so you acquire, a, for example, an A-scan that looks like this, uh, but then you have to apply a fast Fourier transform to turn it into the type of A-scan we're used to seeing. So in any event, what about the sensitivity advantage? So I want to show this illustration from a, from a nice spectral domain OCT device, and this is actually a B-scan of my eye. And this is the vitreous, uh, the, the zero delay line has been oriented to the vitreous. And as you know, with spectral domain or swept source systems, there's a, you have to set one direction of where the sensitivity is optimal. And so look at the external limiting membrane, which of course is this very fine structure that you can see there in my eye. And as you move the scan, as your photographer changes the focus to move the scan, scan away from the point of maximum sensitivity, you can see that it gets harder and harder to see the external limiting membrane. I mean, maybe you can pick it out still, but it's pretty difficult to see. And that is a very nice illustration of this type of sensitivity drop. Uh, and so again, the, the key advantage with swept source OCT is that yes, there's some drop in sensitivity, but you can see with depth the drop in sensitivity is much less. And that really has very important implications, I think, uh, for imaging compared to spectral domain OCT. And maybe it's easier to see side by side as you move away from the zero delay line, what happens to the sensitivity of the images with spectral domain versus uh, swept source. So again, uh, you know, in terms of the technologies that we have that are capable of both anterior and posterior segment imaging in the swept source realm, we're really talking about the TopCon devices, so that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and again, as I said, when you have this type of, uh, of, of lack of sensitivity loss with depth, it really aids you in your visualization of the outer retinal structures and the choroid. Uh, and one of the topics that's been of great interest recently in the research space is studying the internal structures of pigment epithelial detachments. And you can see, you can see a lot of detail. Many of us look when we treat PEDs, we try to eliminate the fluid, but not necessarily the neovascular tissue. And if you want to do that type of treatment strategy, then you really need to have to have a fine imaging 
of the internal structure of pigment epithelial detachments. Now, there are some swept source systems, uh, if you, especially if you're imaging a patient who has relatively few optical aberrations, you can actually image with extensive averaging and even start to see the outer segment mosaic. Almost without AO imaging, you can, uh, you can start to see this, which is pretty spectacular. Uh, and of course, when, uh, another big advantage of swept source is you can scan at very high speed, so you can scan very large areas uh, in, 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 a, in a rapid uh, fashion, and there are research devices that actually operate in millions of A-scans per second, so-called megahertz OCT, and at that point you can scan very large areas and you can get essentially OCT images that very much look like our traditional fundus images. The big difference though is these OCT images, we can acquire them from any where we can present them from any layer of interest. So it's not just like a typical fundus image, which is a summation. You can actually get the image from different layers and different structures. And again, this on FOSS strategy for looking at OCT data, I strongly believe is the future of how we'll be looking at our OCT images. In any event, uh, acquiring big field images, yes, of course you can do this with spectral domain systems. It just happens to be easier to do with uh, swept source devices. And of course you get beautiful imaging of the deep parts of the eye. Uh, look at how deep you can get into the lamina carbosa. Our glaucoma faculty, as it turns out, is very interested in studying laminar anatomy uh, and how and its implications for glaucoma that we're now able to do with some ease uh, with swept source uh, uh, technology. So this is an example of a patient. Again, you know, anybody can show great uh, quality individual B scans, but I like to look at my volume scans. I'm not sure how many in the audience traditionally look at all of their B scans, but getting good quality volume scans is pretty important. So this is an example of a patient. Oh, let me go back here, excuse me. Sorry, this is a, a patient, of course, uh, who um, has, uh, I think it's pretty apparent, an, an abnormality involving the optic nerve, as well as you'll see the fluid in the macula. But actually, when you see the fluorescent angiogram, it even highlights the optic nerve abnormality. But it was really nicely illustrated. You saw on the, on the uh, swept source OCT scan. And I thought just for ease of illustration, we'll take one of the B scans. And you can see this patient obviously has a pit maculopathy. But look how you can see to, all the way to the base of the pit. You actually can image the, the remnants of the lamina at the base of the pit, which again, I'm mainly showing this case to illustrate the power of the technology for deep, um, uh, deep imaging in our clinical experience at least. So uh, this is just another uh, patient uh, where, we're, where we've had um, uh, a, a, a patient with hypotony maculopathy. You see the choroidal folds. Again, it was nice to get these large cubes. Again, getting a big B scan, not a big problem. Getting dense cubes uh, that really uh, make, uh, facilitate getting uh, good quality on fuss images. I think that's the advantage that we have. Also, another uh, case to, let me see, can you click in this movie for me somehow? It's not playing automatically. Uh, but uh, what I really want to illustrate in this movie was the fact that the image quality in the anterior retina. Are you able, can you start the movie please? You just have to click down here someplace. Uh, so in any event, uh, I, w I want to illustrate uh, the, the fact that, thank you, uh, that the, the image quality, even in this really deep staphyloma on this patient, is pretty similar in the anterior and posterior aspects of the retina, which we found to be um, especially helpful, as I said, for on fuss images. Another patient with an AION, uh, you'll see actually this patient has a fairly prominent thickening of the optic nerve, but you actually can see the subretinal fluid that's accumulated in this uh, patient, even at the base of the, of the, of the optic nerve. Uh, again, uh, you know, this on FOSS way of looking at images, I think, is really going to be the future of how we look at our OCT data. Uh, I'm getting used to now looking at uh, my, my patients with these kinds of on FOSS movies, uh, which I think are really facilitated by the dense scanning protocols that we use now in clinical practice. So I thought I'd share another anecdote of a, of a case that I think really hits home the advantages of looking at our our OCT data and an on FOSS strategy. This is a 51-year-old patient, came in with an acute uh, onset scotoma, had a history of migraines. The referring ophthalmologist thought the examination was normal. I think it's pretty clear that it's not normal. I think you can see, especially on the red free, that there's something abnormal there. So what is it? I mean, maybe many of you already know, this is the autofluorescence image uh, highlighting that. Uh, there's no leakage on the fluorescent angiogram on this patient in that area. But what you can certainly see on the, on the OCT imaging, you'll see it even on the B scans as they're going by, that there is an abnormality of the inner nuclear layer that you can see right there. It's abnormally bright. But I tell you, it's a lot easier to see and understand the distribution of the abnormalities when you look at it in the on fuss mode. You'll see that patch appear there. And I'll take one slab right from that inner nuclear layer uh, for illustration. 
and you'll see that that abnormality is, again, this is an unfossed slab obtained at the level of the inner nuclear layer. You can see there's this patch of hyperreflectivity that's present there. And this, of course, what's the diagnosis? Pretty obvious. This patient has paracentral acute middle maculopathy, in this case associated with migraine, which is um, unusual, but has been described. Uh, again, we talked about the advantage of sensitivity, but I want to highlight from a clinical uh, device perspective, uh, we are fortunate these swept source devices do operate with a, with a longer wavelength. And just as a reminder, I mean, we're talking about operating at the one micron regime or 10, 50 nanometers in this case, and contrast that to our usual uh, spectral domain devices that operate, unless there's some research sy systems that operate in green, but most of them operate uh, at, uh, at 840 uh, uh, or so. Uh, and so again, why is that for posterior segment imaging, you're obviously you have to get your light through a lot of water in the vitreous, so uh, you're really confined by the absorption spectrum of water. So uh, of course imaging in the, in the visible uh, portion of the spectrum, pretty easy. Uh, but there is a relative dip here uh, at 10, 15 nanometers uh, that allows us to actually image the posterior segment using OCT, hence why we have that. And, uh, and again, you know, uh, being able to image uh, deep structures, imaging choroidal melanomas and the like uh, has been facilitated uh, by this uh, approach, uh, for example. Uh, and this is just, just the, 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 the uh, B-scan movie of that same case. But I'm not going to say too much about that because David Pelias is going to give a very nice presentation about that coming up and really talk about this important application of swept source OCT, but of course, uh, you know, being able to, to do volumetric imaging of the choroid may be relevant for many diseases, including patients with central serous who can have massively dilated uh, choroidal uh, vessels. Uh, but there are other applications as, as well. One of the things that we find particularly helpful uh, is in imaging patients with geographic atrophy. And oftentimes, to, to get the geographic atrophy image, we'll take a slab image at the level of the choroid. But actually, with swept source OCT, because of the deep penetration, uh, you actually get even better contrast when you take the slab with the sclera. Actually, this is an example of outlining the area of atrophy on, on a, a scleral slab uh, assessment in a patient with GA. But it's not just for uh, imaging uh, the choroid uh, and deeper structures. Keep in mind that the, uh, the benefits and sensitivity uh, can appear um, elsewhere as well. Uh, and we can get great vitreous imaging with these devices. And there's a lot of interest now uh, from the FDA level as well as you know, uh, from a variety of other groups looking at new uh, endpoints for uveitis based on imaging and quantifying cell and OCT. So I would stay tuned for that because that work is in progress, uh, even at a regulatory level. So in any event, uh, I, will, I will say that, uh, that uh, you know, this type of enhanced vitreous imaging is something, I mean, I don't really think you need to really enhance it much because you see the vitreous quite well with these devices, but that's also a new mode that, um, that the devices uh, feature. And showed, uh, 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 Dr. Kishi in, in Japan uh, had done some very nice work where he studied uh, the evolution of PVD very nicely nicely uh, using, um, using an Atlantis uh, OCT uh, device. Uh, but I didn't want you to leave today thinking um, that this is just for the posterior segment. Obviously, I'm a retina specialist, so my talk is heavy on the retina. <clears throat> but as I said, our anterior segment colleagues have been very interested in OCT, uh, and especially with new therapies that are targeting the angle uh, or have um, um, or devices or materials that may reside in the angle. Uh, studying the angle has become very important uh, now, uh, and uh, so traditionally we've done this with time domain, uh, long wavelength uh, devices, but more recently we've switched to using spectral domain devices for many of the trials in the reading center. But you can see there is a challenge at 840 nanometers for visualizing the angle recess, and that's something where uh, swept source devices really shine, uh, uh, but, but more than the swept source, the fact that they're long wavelength at 1050, you're able to actually get into the angle recess, uh, and in fact you actually can get through the sclera quite well. You can actually image the pars plana uh, quite nicely and consistently, we found in patients using uh, 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 swept source OCT. Uh, and there are also opportunities to look at other structures. Uh, in the dry eye space for clinical trials, there's a lot of in, in interest in doing volumetric imaging of the tear meniscus and the tear film. Here you can see the tear film quite nice, or the tear meniscus, the tear lake, uh, quite nicely illustrated on the image. Uh, here's just another image, again, showing you the beautiful quality that you get. Look at the angle reading. It's spectacular how well you can see the recess, in fact. But in any event, here you can actually see the particulate matter uh, in the tear film. So that may actually have implications for our dry eye uh, patients as well. So that's another potentially exciting future clinical application. And our glaucoma colleagues are, have been imaging their filtering uh, blebs, and you can see the cystic spaces. And you actually get a pretty good depth of penetration uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with this uh, image that was captured on the Triton. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to switch gears uh, and finish up with a swept source OCT and geography. And OCT and geography is the huge rage. I think there's another instructional course I was told following uh, this symposium as well. Uh, but in any event, I just want to start out with a definition. What do we mean by OCT and geography? Uh, we're referring to the isolation or extraction of the microvascular circulation from the OCT image data using a combination of specialized image acquisition as well as processing techniques that don't involve the use of an invasive dye. So that's sort of the basic uh, definition. So in terms of how you approach the problem, all of the techniques are, both, uh, are based on, so far at least, are based on, on uh, extra, uh, uh, developing a motion uh, contrast. So you can imagine if you're able to eliminate Brownian motion and in bulk motion or patient eye movement, what else is moving in the eye? Uh, uh, primarily that's the blood flow in the retinal blood vessels. Uh, and so that's really what you're trying to, to get. And how do you get the contrast to actually detect motion in the eye? One, you can look for the, the phase shift that's produced by musing, moving structures, or you can look for a magnitude variation. And you can think of this as, you know, as blood cells come in and out of a, a particular voxel in the OCT image, there can be a change in the intensity of the reflection at that location. So if you're scanning the same location very fast over time and you're looking for differences in the brightness between the images, then you might be able to extract something that's moving. Uh, and that's how that's one approach to motion contrast. And again, uh, you can do this with spectral domain or swept source systems. Nathan Chowdhury in the next talk is going to be talking specifically about some of the advantages that he's seen in his clinical practice uh, with doing this with a swept source approach. Uh, you can sort of guess some potential advantages based on what I've already said about swept source OCT with regards to its deeper penetration and potentially better visualization of deeper vascular uh, structures. But what are the advantages? Why has there been so much press? And I'll tell you at the upcoming ARVO, we're going to have two paper sessions on OCT and geography alone, uh, and, uh, and as well as a symposium and the like, and it's just gone crazy, right? So what are the advantages of OCT over conventional angiography? Well, you know, it's obviously non-invasive and no dye. Uh, it's rapid, uh, and you can do it on your existing OCT platforms. And what does this translate to? It means you can do it frequently, which means it's very useful for longitudinal assessments and for incorporation into clinical trials. Also gives us better vascular detail. One of the structures that we never saw before with conventional angiography was uh, radi the radial parapapillary capillary network. Uh, and so that may have some relevance to optic neuropathies and glaucoma. In addition, it's depth resolved, meaning that you can see multiple capillary layers uh, in the retina. And of course, what's really exciting for all of us as clinicians is the prospect of automated quantitative data. Okay, so again, you know, uh, to understand OCT and geography, and there'll be so many courses, I'm sure, at Academy uh, uh, next year as well on, on, on interpreting OCT and geography, and believe me, we need it because it's complicated, uh, but you need to know what normal is, uh, and of course, this is just going through, just, you know, you can see where the, the slab is obtained, uh, but as you slab uh, through uh, the, the retina, you can see that the appearance of the capillary plexus uh, does change over time, its morphology as well as its... Um, its uh, dimensions uh, can be uh, quite uh, different. Here's just uh, two of those slabs, just for your interest. And you can see the difference in the size of the foveal vascular zone, as well as, again, even the morphology of the capillary network and the orientation. There seem to be some interesting differences. The only caution and caveat is, you know, what you see here obviously depends on how you chose your boundary lines. And as you'll see, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of differences and variance, even amongst devices as to how this is done, which is a real problem. So one of the, the, the approaches in the Reading Center, because the DRCRNet uh, in the US is already incorporating OCT and geography into trials, and so how do we deal with this segmentation and then segmentation problems in the setting of disease? One uh, approach to sort of try to hope that we are not fooling ourselves uh, is that we look at these things with these types of on FOSS movies. Again, I've been stressing this on FOSS approach to looking at OCT data. With OCT and geography, it's really risen to front and center, but looking at it through this type of movie-based approach, I think is going to have real legs uh, going forward in the future. So again, uh, again, I apologize for boring you with some things that are maybe of only interest to Reading Center people, but you know, to understand uh, what the data means in the setting of disease, you need to know that it's reliable and reproducible. So we've done a lot of studies now following subjects over time uh, and acquiring images in different settings to see how does it change 
You know, what, is the, what are the limits of repeatability? Uh, and so that seems actually pretty promising. Uh, the great thing about OCT and geography, of course, is that there's such contrast for seeing the vessels that it makes quantification uh, relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, and uh, so skeletonizing the vessels and then doing a variety of different metrics, uh, I think, is, is relatively easy. Uh, there are some challenges, though. One of the things I highlighted was maybe it might be interesting to measure the foveal of ascular zone. But, but when you're trying to compare normal to disease, it's a big problem when there's a big variation in normal. I mean, these are all normal subjects, and you can see the FAZ size is quite different. So how can you understand what is truly pathologic when there's such normal variation? How can you adjust for this? Well, one approach uh, may be that you might be able to make a correction based on the morphology of the, uh, of the pit on the reflectance OCT. This was a nice uh, study that was done that showed there is a relationship between the volume of the pit and the area of the FAZ. Unfortunately, you can see here there's a relationship, but there's a lot of scatter as well. So it's not a perfect solution, but it may be one way to, to handle this. Now, it, you know, the other challenge, though, is, is there even a single FAZ measurement? I've already highlighted the difference in the FAZ superficially and deep. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've published on this and measuring the FAZ at, at different, different uh, depths, in, in fact. Uh, and again, this is just showing that same uh, thing uh, from that paper, showing the difference in, these, in the size of the FAZ. Uh, fortunately, this is a very consistent observation regardless of device. Uh, we actually demonstrated in that paper that there's uh, a difference in terms of the FAZ um, the area and the diameter between the superficial and deep. And this is sort of, uh, sort of a summary of all the papers in the literature that have looked at FAZ size. Our results are pretty much in the same range. Uh, but again, you know, the real interest though is how can we take this normal information, apply it uh, to the setting of disease. Uh, this is an illustration of a patient with non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. And you can see that there are some uh, significant uh, vascular alterations, including aneurysmal changes. And I don't have all of the, uh, the data included in this presentation, but there have been nice papers that have shown that you don't see all of the microaneurysms that you see on a fluorescein angiogram, on an OCT angiogram. Part of that relates to the likely slow flow that's occurring in these aneurysms. But one of the things that we have seen, and, and we're not the first to describe this, several groups have, is that the vascular alterations, particularly the microaneurysms, seem to be more prominent in the deeper layer compared to the superficial layer. So we didn't really understand that before with fluorescein angiography, but we are in a position to understand that now with the depth resolved capability of, of OCT angiography. Uh, and again, you know, despite the, the overlap or the, I guess, the, the huge amount of variability uh, in normals, we were able to, I mean, this is a study that we recently did, just looking at patients with moderate to severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we found that the FAZ, in fact, was significantly enlarged compared to patients who were age-matched normals. Not shocking, but it's something that you can, you can measure still. But FAZ measurements are probably only one of many metrics that we will use to study and evaluate our OCT angiography data. Another important one, will, I think, will be capillary uh, density. And in that same paper, we also looked at capillary densities in different rings around the, around the foveal vascular zone. It's not so important, uh, the, the ring dimensions that we used. Uh, but just to make the point uh, that, in fact, we were able to see in normals, for example, uh, that, uh, that you know, the, the inner ring, uh, there was more difference between the superficial and deeper layer. But by the time you got to the outer ring, uh, the capillary density was actually pretty similar in the superficial and deep retina in normals. And so we contrasted this to our cohort of patients with diabetes. And again, we're able to show and demonstrate using this approach a significant reduction in the capillary density uh, in, in patients with more advanced diabetic retinopathy. And again, this is the kind of thing that the DR Serenet is interested in. You know, do these things have implications for outcomes for patients? Obviously, you'd imagine if you had really severe capillary dropout, you'd expect the patient's going to have a poor prognosis. But perhaps finer gradations, we can find useful information. But we don't know yet. I mean, the reality is that this is still being uh, studied. Uh, this is a patient who presented with a single cotton wool spot. We're not sure why, actually. Uh, but just to show that the superficial and the deep capillary plexus in this patient, you can see there really seems to be a significant defect 
And I have to say that I'm not sure if this patient, I suspect that the perfusion is probably reduced there, but you can also see that there is a drop in, 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 in signal. Now, there seems to be very uh, low signal uh, on, the, on the, OC, the, the angiographic image compared to the, the standard reflectance image, uh, but there's still some po probable loss of sensitivity. You're not entirely sure, but this kind of comparison where you look at the drop in sensitivity in the reflectance image relative to the, the, the OCT angiography um, the image, uh, B-scan, uh, can maybe sometimes be helpful as you try to ascertain, is this an artifact? Is that actually uh, true capillary dropout? Which we suspect there is true dropout in this particular individual. Let me show you another illustration. This is a patient who came in complaining of blurring of vision in both eyes over the last um, 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 year or so, a uh, relatively young individual. Uh, and you can see that this is the, 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 the B-scan. Um, uh, and you can see pretty easily, you, know, you can probably already know what the diagnosis is. You saw it go by on the on FOSS image. It's much quicker to look at that, by the way. But you can see these cavitary lesions in the retina. Probably everyone here knows the diagnosis uh, for this, uh, this uh, patient. Uh, this is, um, let me just go forward here, sorry. Uh, this is the, the color image, and you can see that there is a little bit of a grayish haze here, maybe even a venule that's doing something funny there. Uh, and of course, you saw the cavitary lesions in, in the retina. Uh, but, uh, but notice uh, that when we did the OCT angiographic image on this patient, uh, yes, the superficial capillary plexus looked a little bit abnormal, but what was really striking was when we dropped even below the deep plexus down towards the, the, to, to, towards the outer nuclear layer, we were still seeing these vessels, and they were sort of these dilated abnormal vessels. Uh, and of course, you know, you, uh, we didn't see anything down at the photoreceptor level except the cavitations, uh, and, uh, and nor did we see an abnormality at the choriocapillaris level in this patient. So uh, again, what's the diagnosis? Well, the fluorescent angiogram was probably not necessary. That's one of the conditions where we probably aren't needing fluorescent angiography anymore because we really can make the diagnosis quite well with OCT angiography. And this, of course, this patient has MACTEL uh, type 2, a fairly typical uh, presentation confirmed. Uh, by OCT angiography, and there are a variety of different retinal vascular disease applications. MacTel and diabetic retinopathy are are, uh, are a couple, and uh, Carl Glittenberg uh, has uh, has uh, done a lot of these nice sort of 3D renderings. Um, and um, and uh, you know, uh, Rick Spade is is someone who's really touted as we think about how do we visualize our OCT angiography data in a way that we can understand clinically, uh, you know, volume rendering may actually play a role. We always thought volume rendering was kind of a gimmick uh, and, and may, you know, in our management of patients. Maybe for vitreo retinal interface disorders it was useful, but for OCT and geography it may have real legs. I mean, these are the kinds of things we're trying to think about in the reading center. How can we deal with different artifacts and how can we understand what's going on? So I think Rick may be correct, in fact. There's another illustration of a patient from Carl uh, with, uh, with a uh, branch retinal vein occlusion with non-perfusion that you can see there. Uh, and with this type of nice um, volume rendering approach. Maybe not so useful in this particular case, uh, but uh, I think Nathan is going to show you some nice uh, cortical vascularization cases where I think there's some real uh, potential value uh, in this approach. So that's a good segue to talk about cortical vascular disease, and this will be sort of the last topic that I'll cover. Uh, and uh, so again, uh, you know, uh, OCT angiography is really kind of, you'll see so many papers coming out on looking at cortical vascularization, like this patient who has a pretty, you know, beautiful, actually, you can see on this, uh, on this web source image, how beautifully you can see the, the laminar structure within the uh, fibrovascular pigment epithelial attachment all the way out to, to Burke's membrane here. But when we do the OCT angiogram on this patient, and Carl helped us with some of the processing, you really can get a really nice contrast for identifying the cortical vascular membrane. It's actually uh, quite impressive. And some things to point out, I mean, it does seem that the, the density of vessels is reduced more centrally compared to peripherally. It's what we'd predict based on what we know from anatomy and also our experience. The vessels mature in the center, the more active vessels are at the periphery of the membrane. So that's actually kind of nice. But what was neat was this patient came back a few months later complaining of some vision loss, and now you can see there's an additional abnormality in the subretinal space of this patient. There's also a little bit of hemorrhage associated with this. So what's going on? Well, this is what we saw now in the OCT angiogram. Not only did we see this large complex uh, present um, um, uh, in the um, 
sub RP space, but now we saw this additional uh, um, um, uh, vascular abnormality which corresponded to this. So this patient actually had a type 1 membrane that ruptured through uh, the RPE and developed an additional uh, type 2 component. It's easier to compare there between these two visits. So there's some very nice changes that you can detect uh, and follow over time using the OCT angiography. There are various patterns that you can see. This is a patient who had sort of like a chronic membrane, was starting to develop some atrophy, uh, and you can see the large vessels corresponding to this portion of it under the RPE, RPE the, 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 sort of the residual RPE space here. Uh, people have already started to come up with some very interesting names. Some people have called this a dead tree uh, and things of that sort. And fortunately, we're going to have a Macular Society pre-meeting this year where we're going to try to actually get to a consensus classification. So we start you know, using the same terms. But what's interesting is this patient developed some additional um, subretinal uh, hyperreflective material here. What is it? Is that just exudation? Is that fibrin? No, actually it's a nice new net that developed adjacent to the dead tree uh, in this particular case. Another entity that's gotten a lot of interest now are these patients who don't have any exudation but have uh, suspicious looking PEDs. And now we're recognizing that a lot of these patients have, have cortical neovascularization. Phil Rosenfeld has suggested this term intermediate neovascular AMD for these cases. There's some uncertainty as to uh, how to man best manage these patients. Uh, and, uh, you know, because we were never treating these patients before. And should we be treating some of them? Maybe. We'll see. Okay, and then these are a couple more cases. These are a couple of cases from uh, Carl, just to illustrate different patterns of nets. I included this one mainly because Carl thought maybe he could see even a polyp in this case. I don't know if that's actually a, a polyp. Uh, most, most of us have thought that the flow is too slow in polyps to really visualize them using our, uh, our current OCT angiography methods, uh, but that's something that's an area of hot study and an interest uh, right now. Uh, we've been very interested in quantitative analysis of these membranes because you get such uh, great contrast. It's pretty easy to extract the net, actually, as you're seeing uh, from these uh, cases. Uh, and so you can easily compute an area of the lesion. And then you can actually look to see how much of the lesion is actually composed of vessels themselves. And so you can uh, compute that. And of course, then you can use that to compute very simply a vessel density. There are a whole host of other metrics. I don't have time to go into the kinds of things that we're looking at. But these are some that uh, people have proposed to use in quarterly vascularization trials uh, moving forward, like this case from um, their colleague David Seraf, who has looked at the change in these lesions over time. And of course, they've been suggested already as uh, endpoints uh, for use in trials, and there's some uh, ISTs that have, have started that have been uh, doing that type of thing, in fact. Uh, and of course, there may be new endpoints for initiating treatment. We talked about these intermediate neovascular AMD cases. Do you treat such a patient? No fluid, uh, but just this membrane. Don't know yet. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there are already um, those, um, those among us are using this uh, to guide retreatment. Again, we don't have all the data, so I'm worried about using this to guide retreatment. So some people are saying, well, if I treat a patient and then the membrane disappears, if it comes back on OCT angiography, even if there's no fluid, maybe I should treat them with anti-VEGF therapy or maybe I shouldn't extend them if I'm doing treat and extend. Uh, I don't know if that's the right thing. We don't know, but that's the kind of thing that we all obviously need to carefully study. And of course, uh, you know, there may be prognostic in, in, in implications. Again, I've replaced dead tree with discoform here, uh, but the implication is that there may be a variety of different phenotypes that we see on OCT angiography that may tell us something about what is going to happen with this membrane. So lastly, I'll mention just briefly about geographic atrophy because it's an area of great personal interest for me. And obviously, when you have the RPE lost, it's very easy to see the deeper choroidal structures. Uh, and of course, you can still see the normal capillaris here. But that's not the part that's interesting. The interesting part is what's happening here. You know, you can see that there seems to be some attenuation of the chorea capillaris at the margin of the lesion. And that's kind of a hot area as we think about new ways of defining uh, atrophy. So stay tuned for that. I don't want to leave this talk without making it seem that OCT angiography is some perfect technology because it's far from that. Uh, there's still a long ways to go, I think. Uh, processing algorithms are still um, evolving, as I mentioned. You know, we're still lacking all of the supportive clinical trial data, but that's coming. That uh, problem, I think, is going to be solved. Uh, you do need to have efficient tracking systems. And the nice thing with the, the Triton device that we've been using is it has a great tracker uh, and it really eliminates the, 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 the motion, uh, motion artifact, excuse me, the, um, the patient movement artifact. But still, you can have um, projection artifact from motion created by overlying vessels. And Nathan's going to talk a lot about that as well. And that's actually a real challenge in interpreting uh, these OCT angiographic images. And of course, I al we already talked about how interpretation depends on accurate segmentation. And we don't learn anything about leakage as of yet. And that might 
might change. Johannes de Boer's done some nice work that's suggestive, but we'll have to see. So in any event, I'll close with this last slide. Um, um, uh, really, I, hopefully, I've, I've been able to convey some of the potential value of swept source OCT and OCT angiography. I think it's really enhanced our evaluation of deep retinal pathology, uh, the choroid, the vitreous, and the anterior segment. I think on FOS is the way to go for the future. Um, and this ability to really see the, the circulation non-invasively in a depth resolved fashion, I think, is very useful and really, I think, has further expanded the role of OCT in managing our patients. Thank you very much. We really thanks for this wonderful talk to Dr. Sara, and I want to ask you if you have any questions from the audience. We have time for one or two questions. Everything is very clear? No. Better. OK, very good. <laughs> then we thanks, Dr. Sara. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Dr. Nathan Chaudhry. He's director of Herzig Eye Institute of Toronto, Canada. And he will talk to us about the swept source OCT compared to spectral domain imaging. Please, Dr. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to thank TopCon and, uh, and the uh, other physicians for inviting me to share my experience. Uh, it's a, it is definitely, as Voss said, it's an evolving world with respect to the, uh, the images that we're seeing and these technologies. Um, and, I, and I think the information is changing very rapidly. So these are my disclosures. Uh, is there a way to fix the screen so we can get the, uh, the view to be a little bit different? So we can see this a little more clearly to shrink. Obviously, I'm a speaker for TopCon. So basically, I want to give you the take-home points right off the bat. Uh, OCTA uh, is an evolving imaging modality, which we've already seen with Voss's amazing talk. Uh, swept source, of course, as mentioned, is a longer wavelength at 1050 nanometers than what we're traditionally used to at SDOCT at 840. The penetration through media opacities is superior, and we're going to see some great examples of that. And particularly when we look at OCT angiography, which is so sensitive to motion, so sensitive to media, and, and also very rapid, getting access through media opacities is very key. Uh, obviously, we mentioned this rapid image acquisition time with swept source. And ultimately, these technologies, as they're evolving, they are going to be limited in, as, we, as we are with under, our understanding of them uh, with motion artifacts and segmentation. So we'll look at some of those examples. So successful OCT imaging, I mean, I think all of us can agree that we are not, the, do the doctors aren't the ones who take the images every day. Our technicians and photographers are the ones who take the images. And really the key to successful imaging, which we can all agree on, is a cooperative patient, a reasonable media clarity, having a device that's easy to use, easy to integrate into our clinical practice, and something that allows us to have robust software and post-acquisition analysis. And that's what really gives us a really robust device. So taking a look at that, in challenging technology, in ch the challenge in comparing technologies such as swept source and spectral domain is we're not really comparing apples and apples. Uh, they are different in a number of ways. Uh, first, of course, in the way in which they acquire images. They acquire images differently. They use different segmentation algorithms. And Voss pointed out earlier that segmentation is very key. Uh, the differences between segmentation algorithms can be the difference between detecting membranes and detecting pathology or missing. And we'll see some examples of that. And ultimately, there is a post-image acquisition processing that occurs with every machine. And these technologies do this differently. So while, we are gonna, while I am going to present some information on spectral domain and swept source, it's important to realize that devices themselves are designed and built very differently. So the TopCon Triton, as was presented earlier, is a swept source, the first commercially available swept source device at 1050 nanometers at 100,000 A scans per second. Uh, it offers multimodality imaging, which we've seen. It offers OCT angiography at three and a half, four and a half, and six, and even uh, four millimeters uh, of view, and at one micron uh, wavelength. So this is a pretty robust device. So let's take a look at something in our real world practice. Uh, many of us may be vitreoretinal surgeons who see patients with gas, and most of us see patients with cataract, and we all fear the fact that we have patients that have m massive amounts of blood in their eye. All of these pose a barrier to acquiring day-to-day -day routine transverse OCTB scans, but of course would pose an even greater barrier for OCT and geography. Uh, 
So just in the last week, I put together these three cases from patients that came in the clinic. Uh, we can see a patient here with post-op day one macular hole surgery. This is a patient with post-op day one, 95% SF6 gas fill. The fovea is clearly visible. Obviously, this is a very myopic fundus. There was no adjustments that were made in order to acquire this image. The 1050 nanometer wavelength goes through this very easily. Here's a patient with wet uh, AMD with three plus cataract. Again, very clear view of through media, uh, through hazy media, but very clear view of the retinal uh, architecture and the CNVM. And finally, uh, on Thursday before I left for this, uh, for this uh, meeting, we saw a patient with this massive pre subhyloid uh, and diffuse hemorrhagic presentation of PDR. And again, another great example of penetrating through blood. And you can see the hyperreflective material underneath the hyloid but a very clear view of the retinal architecture with very little backscattering. And those of us that have up to this point been using spectral domain OCT are well aware of the fact that it doesn't penetrate these three different uh, modalities very well. Uh, and that's the difference between swept source and spectral domain right off the bat. So what about image acquisition? We all know that we want to have uh, get through our clinics in a timely manner. We have hundreds potentially of patients coming in every day. They all require OCT imaging. How much of an interference is OCT angiography or swept source uh, imaging going to be in our practice? So video A on the far left is going to be of a patient that is having a uh, spectral domain OCT performed. The first step here is going to be to acquire a horizontal line scan with one of the competing devices. Uh, and then the patient will obtain a 3 by 3 millimeter OCT angiography image. So we can see off the bat that the, the, the machine has a unique way of acquiring image. Focusing is required before the acquisition of the image. There's pro processing that happens during the acquisition of the image. And we're still acquiring the single, single line scan for this patient. And it's a relatively nice looking spectral domain OCT image. But time is ticking, the patient gets impatient and they may be moving. Now we want to acquire an OCTA, OCT angiography image, and what we're going to see is that this also takes a significant amount of time. Some, there are a number of OCTA devices, of course, on the market, and they all deal with motion correction in a different way. The first here in this case is to acquire a horizontal raster line scan image, which you can see, followed by a vertical raster OCTA line scan uh, image, and then they are merged together in this particular technology to eliminate motion artifact. So you can see here the clock is ticking, the patient's still there, and the technician's working away. So every device has its own challenges. So when we take a look at the swept source Triton image, we'll do the same thing. Same patient, same day, same eye. We're going to take a single line scan using swept source. Again, patients may be moving, but we have the ability to get a good quality image. There's our single line scan for this patient. They're blinking, you can see in the corner. There's our line scan image, swept source, relatively fast. And that's one of the beauties of swept source, fast acquisition time. So now we're going to go ahead and take our OCT angiography image. This is also a 3 by 3 millimeter image of this patient, raster scan. And we can see that the difference in this case is with motion correction, we use registration with the Triton. And as a result, we can tell in real time whether the patient's moving and what kind of image we're going to be getting. So this patient's going to be getting their image, of course, and we can see as the, as the line scans are performed, if the patient moves, we get a red bar, and it will not proceed if the patient's moving. So it's a lot faster acquisition time. There's less post-processing that occurs, and it makes things a lot more easier for a very busy clinical practice. So one thing to keep in mind that was pointed out by Voss earlier, of course, is that OCT and geography is part of the picture. And this is an example of a 12, uh, 12, uh, 6 by 6 millimeter slab, and those of us that are using ultra-wide field angiography would probably agree that angiography is not dead yet, but OCTA is one piece of the overall puzzle. So swap source OCTA uh, is very similar to the other spectral domain OCTA devices in that we get information about the superficial capillary plexus, the deep capillary plexus, and the chorea capillaris. As mentioned, these devices all segment these layers very differently based on the way they are designed. And the, the segmentation lines are placed at different locations in order to achieve and obtain the information that we are looking for. So this is an example of the Triton Swept Source OCTA uh, total overview that we get when we get a patient's image. This is a normal eye. 
in a patient with three by three millimeter scanning that's been performed. We can see in the top right corner the superficial capillary plexus, the deep capillary plexus, the outer retina, and of course the query capillaris. And in the bottom middle quadrant here, we see a composite image. This composite image basically shows us in a color coordinated fashion, which vasculature is contributing to the perfusion that we are seeing. So similarly, there's, this is an example of the spectral domain uh, patient, the same patient with a normal macula, uh, three by three. And we get the similar information about the superficial deep and query capillaris. And then our composite is given below with all the vascular layers. So not much difference when we look at a broad overview. And now all these, all these devices also do a really good job of the optic disc. So here's an example of the three by three millimeter view of the optic disc. Again, vitreous nerve head, the radial capillary, uh, peripapillary capillaries, of course, and then finally the choroid. And again, we can see that it does a nice job in a three by three fashion. And then in spectral domain, we have a similar presentation of the optic disc. So when we look at these side by side, what are the major differences? At first, there are not many major differences, but we've already talked about the fact that getting through media opacities is an advantage with swept source. Obviously, the speed of acquisition can be an advantage in the case of swept source. But when we look at these particular frames in the 3x3 scan, one of the, one of the things to notice here actually is that we get a little bit more projection artifact, and that's been my initial ex experience with the spectral domain devices, is that there's a little more projection artifact from the layers above than in the case of swept source. One other element that those of us that are using this device may also be seeing is that the images from, some, from the spectral domain uh, in the chorea capillaris seem a little bit dimmer. Now, whether that's in fact a function of post-processing that occurs with swept source versus spectral domain, that remains to be seen. But would it make sense? Well, we know that spectral domain 8, 840 nanometer wavelength is absorbed by RPE and is also absorbed by lipofusion and drusen. So a choreocapillaris view will be a lot better with the swept source because we can penetrate the RPE since there's no absorption and we can penetrate drusen and lipofusion better with swept source. So we would expect a brighter signal as we do see in the choreocapillaris. So this is a high mag view that shows again a little brighter signal in the choreocapillaris compared to spectral domain. Whether this will be clinically relevant in the future remains to be seen as we begin to resolve the information that we see in choreocapillaris. So what about the optic disc? What are we seeing different in the optic disc? I think from the perspective of the vitreous, the nerve head, and the radial peripapillary capillaries, they're very similar technologies in terms of spectral domain and swept source. But once again, when we look at the choroid, I don't think anyone of, any of us would argue that there is a little bit of a dimming of the signal in the choroid capillaris that we see in the spectral domain realm. And again, that may or may not be a function of post-processing that occurs, but it also may be a contribution from the RPE absorbing the wavelength. So this is, an, this is an example of, again, of a, the entire slab looking at the full spectrum of all the layers of the retina in, in swept source and spectral domain in a normal eye. And one of the elements that I want you to notice here is that the various colored arrows here show a little bit of vascular distortion or a little bit of motion artifact that we see with both technologies. So no matter which technology we're using, we are going to get some element of distortion that we see in some of the vasculature as a result of the patient's motion that, or we would call it potentially noise, that we have to be aware of when interpreting these images. Why is that important? Because when we look at these images, they look pretty good. It's important because as we move towards the analytic software, which Voss touched upon in looking at non-perfusion and vascular density, some of the blurring of the margins may impact what data we get back and what we may call as non-perfusion or vascular density maps in the future. So let's take a look at this other example. So one of the things we touched upon earlier was segmentation. This is a patient with uh, myopic degeneration and all of us will be aware we see a lacquer crack there and there's a choroidal neovascular membrane growing. In the right side of the screen, we're going to see a short video of the spectral domain OCTA image of this patient. The segmentation lines are set at about 50 microns, okay? And we can see a nice crotal neovascular membrane right there. And the point to make here really is that when we look at the segmentation lines here, the segmentation is set to 150 microns, and we do see the CNVM, but we don't see it as clearly. Why is that important? 
Because as I mentioned earlier, when comparing segmentation algorithms between machines, it's important to recognize that they may be different. And in order to get a true head-to-head -head comparison, the segmentations have to be matched. And in this case, we don't see a complete matching, but we are able to elucidate the pathology. So here's another example of the segmentation comparison. Uh, this is another patient with myopic degeneration, and on the left hand of the screen in the red boxes, we can see spectral domain OCT outer retinal image, the outer retina scan, where there should be no vasculature, and we see a choroidal neovascular membrane. And on the right side of the screen, we see the swept source choroidal neovascular membrane within the outer retinal slab. But once again, one thing to call your attention to is that the, the segmentation is different between the two devices. And and that's another reason why, again, the devices themselves, it's difficult to compare them exactly head to head because the segmentation algorithms for these machines are always going to be different, even between other spectral domain OCTA machines. And finally, another final example of segmentation. This is a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, something that I'm sure is seen very, very commonly in Latin America. And this patient has uh, neovascularization neovascularization uh, elsewhere, up here above the vitreous we can see, and the same, uh, same patient, same site is seen in the swept source device. And again, the segmentation is different between the two machines, and again, can be manually adjusted to an extent in each of these devices. And one of the beauties of the, the Triton swept source device is that the composite image really allows you to highlight some of these areas a little bit better, and we can see here the same neovascular net that we saw earlier in the slab. So in terms of angiographic analysis, we've, we've already looked at this earlier, but all the devices pretty much allow you to scrub through layer by layer, looking at the various layers in the OCTA spectrum. This is a patient with diabetes, and as Voss pointed out earlier, the deep capillary plexus, we start to see some of these microaneurysms. Again, this is beautifully done with the swept source software. We can scrub through all the layers, and I believe in all the other spectral domain machines also, it's, there's a similar ability to scrub through the various layers. So let's take a look at some real-world clinical uh, cases. Um, I think this, this technology, again, is in its early days. This is an example of an early uh, wet macular degeneration patient. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the CNVM. And in this volume rendered image, you can see the highlighted area of the choroidal neovascular membrane. Why is this important? I mean, I think as Voss mentioned earlier, we're learning to look at this data in a three-dimensional way. We're going to get better information about the underlying pathophysiology and potentially the management based on these three-dimensional relationships that we haven't really been able to look at before. So while it looks cool, the clinical applications of looking at the overall volume, the areas of non-perfusion, the areas of growth, these are all post-processing analytical software elements that we're going to, as clinicians, probably demand from industry. So this is a patient that has uh, Coates disease, as you can see the ultra-wide field color, uh, pseudo-color image on the far right hand of the screen far left hand of the screen and we can see lots of exudation. The swept source OCT and the spectral domain OCTA composite images are given there. We get a little bit more detail here with the swept source OCTA image, the vascularity that we can see here with the Coates lesions. And, and interestingly, this patient's fovea is completely vascularized, um, and that's a very novel finding in this particular condition. You can see the ultra-wide field angiogram, and then finally a high mag view, really putting all of this together in a multimodality fashion. Here's a patient with a hemiretinal vein occlusion, something again that we see very commonly in all of our practices. The swept source images are seen above. The spectral domain images are seen below for the uh, spectral domain OCTA. Again, a little more projection artifact seen here in the chorea capillaris as compared to the swept source composite. And one more thing I call your attention to is again, getting back to the signal and the absorption that happens from the RPE. The, the image of the deep capillary plexus in the spectral domain image, this image here, seems a little bit darker and less vascular than what we see up here in the deep capillary plexus of the swept source image. So again, that difference may be related to post-processing from the spectral domain side. It may also be related to absorption of the signal from the RPE. And again, as mentioned, swept source really gets through the RPE without any scattering or absorption. <coughs> 
Here's a patient with Stargardt's disease, and we can see here the superficial deep capillary plexus and the chorea capillaris. And take it a step further, uh, Dr. Carl Glittenberg has given, lent us a hand here with this particular image with removing some of the noise in the artifact, and we can see a beautiful image of the area of geographic atrophy and the large dilated choroidal vessels. And all of us know Stargardt's disease ha has associated lipofusion particles that are associated with lipofusion deposits. And in this image here, you can really see the swept source chorea capillaris, the noise-free swept source chorea capillaris, and then the spectral domain chorea capillaris. And the difference I'd call your attention to is the dark areas, which you can see here that are highlighted in the spectral domain image, and those represent the sites of lipofusion, which we see up here. And we know lipofusion will absorb the spectral domain wavelength and potentially manifest itself as what we call flow voids to indicate potential absence of blood flow. And the reality is that signal is being absorbed by the lipofusion and we're getting a false representation of flow, whereas in the swept source image, we don't get the same finding. So these are subtle changes. What their impact might be down the road will depend upon the analytic software that we end up integrating into these devices. <laughs> Proliferative diabetic retinopathy, again, this just highlights the fact that Swept source technology and OC, OCTA is a phenomenal technology. It is growing very rapidly, and we were able to see things almost before they're at the clinical presentation phase. This patient has some mild early neovascularization of the disc. We can see the various layers, but we can see that disc uh, neovascularization a lot better. And again, when we look at the relationships, this is a montage rendered video. And what we can see here is that neovascularization of the disc beautifully in this video before it fully presents itself. It's really a novel way of looking at diabetes that we have not been able to look at before. And Voss showed earlier with the microaneurysms that were seen in the deep capillary plexus. How this will continue to evolve our understanding of th these diseases remains to be seen, but the fact that we're looking is a step in the right direction. Sickle cell retinopathy, another common vascular disease that we commonly see. Uh, this is an example of the swept source images for this patient with the superficial deep and chorea capillaris. We can see areas of non-perfusion in the deep and the chorea capillaris. This may be some projection artifact that we're catching here. And when we look at this compared to spectral domain, we see some differences. The swept source image that we see here shows a little bit of a larger area of non-perfusion compared to its spectral domain counterpart. And the same is true here in the, uh, in the chorea capillaris. So again, it's hard to compare the two technologies directly head to head because they use different approaches to capturing and processing data, but it does give us some insight into what we might be missing and might be capturing with the various approaches. What are the future directions? When we look at this, as we mentioned earlier, this, this technology is very, very early days. We want to see an improvement in the segmentation algorithms. We, want to, we would like to have more perfusion analysis and volume density information. All of us have been looking at ultra-wide field angi angiography now for a number of years, and we've whittled back down to looking at small three millimeter slabs, OCTA slabs. It would be nice to be able to go into wide field OCTA and finally, looking at a change analysis, looking at these choroidal neovascular membranes over time to see if we can make decisions based on what we are seeing non-invasively with OCTA. So basically, to wrap it up, you know, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that you know, we are in the early days of this technology. It's an evolving imaging modality. It is using a longer wavelength with swept source 1050 that does get through significant amount of media opacities. As surgeons, we want to get through cataract, blood, hemorrhage, everything possible. Swept source offers a much more rapid image acquisition time, and that's very critical in this day and age when we have very, very high volume clinical practices. And ultimately, these technologies are both going to be limited by segmentation as well as their motion artifacts and their post-processing capabilities. I'd like to acknowledge my photographer, Dr. Uh, John Golding, and also, of course, Dr. Carl Glittenberg for his help with the images. Thank you.